going live. Yay! Hello, everyone. Welcome to late, this week's episode of Late Night Craft Talk. We are here oh back with Curtis Youngberg, our guest tonight. Isn't it a fun show tonight, guys? I'm so excited. Yay! Yep, this is part two of our interview with Curtis. And tonight, we're going to get on to what we weren't able to talk about two weeks ago. Mars. I know it's so much interesting stuff to talk about, guys. You're going to love it. And you may even have to start, I may have to go take an astronomy class. Or just go to Mars. Yeah, exactly. You go to Mars. Mm -hmm. Totally. Totally. I think that a lot of people will elect to do that. No kidding. Uh, I am going to, I got to start sharing. Yeah. I think I'm, 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 I'm at about 9% of the restart. <laughs> oh, boy. I'm getting up my part. Let's see. Share, share, share. Let's hope. Let's see if I, my voice comes up in the background again, or I got to turn down my sound. No, oh, I don't hear me, so we're good. And you know what? We're actually blank. I need to get a share screen on. Whoopsie. Oh yeah, that could be a bad thing, right? Uh, theoretically, yes. So let me get a share screen on because right now people are probably just looking at my name. They're like, "What the heck? What's going Dang on?" You Why technology. Tang you technology. Is it black? screen's just black it's yeah like well nothing. not now because now we have a hold screen Ooh, oh we have a hold look screen. what we did yeehaw and you can see the bottom of your screen let's see what do you have open right now well let's, let's fix that because there's another snafu let's see okay we have we have oh you oh, have oh, let's uh, fix that hold on oh shoot bang <laughs> Yeah, so this guy today has today, been an interesting day. Fixed. It's been a lot of interesting things happening. Oh, it's been a nutty day. <laughs> Seems like it's like one of those days where there just keeps to being all kinds of fun technical difficulties. It's the day of technical difficulties, people. And we're, we're quite our technology. Right now, we have eight people watching. Let us know who you're from. Hello, Carol Ann. Share, share, yeah. share, everybody. Oh, Carol Ann's watching. Carol Ann is That's watching. Awesome. She actually, she's she's so excited to watch the show. Hoorah. Yay. I'm getting ready to share my end. Hello. I got Princess Leia taking a nap in my lap. She's turning so out to be a really good means... lap dog. So you got Carol Ann Jennifer's on. Hello, Jen. Yay. Hello. We're going to the stars, but only only the fourth rock of the fourth rock from the sun tonight. Yes. It's all about Mars. Savea, do you have any Mars trivia for us right now? You know, I did have Mars trivia. It's on my computer that's restarting, and hopefully, well, I was able to save the document. Okay, well, you know, hello, Lake, hello from Lakeside, California. Hello, Maureen Lynn from Lakeside. Awesomeness. I got to start sharing. Everybody, I hope everybody watching is also sharing right now. So while we're waiting, because we seriously we've we've been having some difficulties, we had to switch around some stuff and uh, Zoom account, and we're like, what is going on? But a little snafus, but it's all fun. We roll with it. So while we're waiting for Savannah to get uh, her computer restarted, she may have disappeared for a moment, but it'll be before we start. Uh, I'll go ahead and throw out some uh, some uh, astronomy trivia on Mars trivia. What Roman god is the planet Mars named after? That's a good trivia know. question. I think that was on my trivia list, actually. Well, I'm just shooting from the hip. Okay. What Roman god was Mars named after, and what was the god of? I'll put it that way. Because I'm almost asking what, who's buried in Grant's tomb. <laughs> wow. That little bit. That's really awesome. Yeah. Okay. Share to newsfeed. All right. I'm getting ready to share my own personal Facebook page. I'm doing that. Let me look at things. Okay. Thank you, Patty. She shared to a bunch of groups. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, All Patty. Right. That's Patty. Hey, Patty, thank you. Awesomeness. Now, can anybody tell me who's Mar what Roman god is Mars named after? He granted, yes, it is who's buried in Grant's tomb, but what was the Roman god of? While you do that, I got to lean over the one. side, type out another. That is a hard one. I don't know. Hey, James, what is it? What's the answer? The answer is. The Mars is named after the Roman god Mars. <laughs> the, the I told you who's buried in Grant's tomb. It is the Roman god of war. 
Oh, war. Bingo. Hello, Marco. Oh, wait, Marco. Okay. It's Maureen saying Marco. Oopsie. Oh. <laughs> All right. More trivia. More trivia. What are trivia. the names of the two moons of Mars? Ooh, that's a hard what one. What are the names of the two small moons that orbit Mars? Not Mars orbits, but orbit Mars. What are the two names? I don't know. Two names. What could it be? What could it be? It is. I'm going to give a few more seconds. Don't, can anybody tell me? Y'all can Google it. You can cheat. Savea can't. I know I can't because like I only am on my phone. I can't like I'm using it as my my microphones. I can't even go to the other area. Then my sound goes away. Yep. You know, I was just typing out my last of my shares and I looked up and went, oh, look, I, the, I actually touched the touchpad and it didn't, try, didn't do anything I typed. Okay. The two <laughs> moons of Mars are Deimos and Phobos. Phobos, like fear, fear of missing out? Yep. Jen's got it. Phobos and Deimos. Awesome. Oh, awesome. Before I know that we went live, so she got it right there before I said it because, cool. you know, the time delay. Deimos and Phobos. Awesome. Now, and I seriously don't know this. Phobos and Deimos come from which ancient mythology? Which ancient civilization? Hmm. When a lot of time, when a lot of these times come with, you know, the, you look at these, it's ancient, you know, Latin languages or whatnot, or Roman, which we'll speaks Latin. Okay, we don't. We'll just skip that little thought right there. But uh, you know, it usually comes down to like just a handful of ancient civilizations from uh, you know Europe, Eurasia, stuff era that area. Yeah, it's ancient Greek, I believe. Yeah, I would think anytime you have like words that end with O, <laughs> like Thanos. Did you just like Thanos? You just said that. Yeah, like with O S, you know, like. Oh, you know what? Today, like, listen to this. Listen to this. You know what I just did? <laughs> nice. Well, I was just saying that Os, like the the O S at the end, has that yeah. kind of Greek sound to it. Gotcha. All right, let's see what That's time it is. That's probably where they got the idea for the name Thanos, even it's though Thanos 1002. Guess what time? It's 10.02. I think we're running a little late. Okay, yeah. So let's start a countdown, yeah? I'm thinking so. Uh, are okay. you updated? You're good to go and you have you can run off your camera? I'm off my cell phone still. I'm at 21% restart. Jeez. Wow, but you you have a camera at your cell? You're, you're good with your cell phone and camera? Yeah, yeah. I'll be on my cell phone. Awesome. Okay. Over, I'll switch over. All right. So Ready? let's go ahead and get started, folks. We're going to have a little bit of a second delay here. Like I said, we have a little bit of a. Oh, Jen said Greek. She's got it. Okay. We're going to do countdown. We're going to have a, the, the, the screen's going to go blank for a few seconds. But don't worry. I have to start. I have to queue up another part of the PowerPoint for the opening credits. So bear with us while it goes blank for just a few seconds. Okay. Ready for a countdown? Okay. Yeah. Let's count down. 10. 10. Nine, eight, seven, six, five, Demos, four, Phobos, Dos, and one. All right, everybody. Showtime. All right, you just gotta like, you know, we'll switch over here a little bit. Just bear with. And okay, let me get the credits going. Yeah, sorry about this, folks, but it is what it is. Hi, my name's Tex, and I'm from Texas Space Texan, Emporium Pick Apart for Used Spacecraft, specifically dealing with Mars. We have, let me show you our inventory a little bit and show what it is. All right, hold on, let me get this going because I'm making excuses right here. All right, let me show you what we got in our inventory here at Space Te Tex Space Texans Used Pick Apart of Spacecraft. Right here, we're located on the planet Mars, a measly 100 billion plus miles away, basically the fourth rock from the sun. So it's easy to get here. We're just the next planet over. We feature in our parts, we feature used orbiters. These are American. They're vintage too. They're from the 1960s and 70s. And we also feature, if I can get the slide to go, we also feature, come on slide, there we go. We also feature rovers that appear on Mars. These are vintage pieces. Some are fairly modern. They're a little bit used. 
Matter of fact, the one on the left, you can use to repair your own car. And the one on the right, you can use as a car. And it's even got a laser beam on it. We also feature foreign vehicles. These are early Soviet orbiters that went around Mars that didn't work so good because they either bypassed it. But either way, we got vintage parts. So we also deal with foreign vehicles. We also have landers on Mars. There we go, it finally popped up. We also have landers. We have that little uh, Sputnik thing right there on the left of Soviet. So again, we deal with foreign, foreign vehicles. And we have art on the right that came from a couple of land, couple of, scored a couple of rovers in the 1990s. So it's a kind of more, kind, kind of modern right there, but they feature airbags. Airbags on another planet. You can use it to inflate and make an easy boy lounger. This ultra light, because Mars only got 30% of the gravity of Earth. So just remember, if you're going to find, you're out, out on a Sunday flight across the solar system, stop at Texas Space. Texans, House of Used Orbiters, Landers, and Rovers, pick apart. I'm Tex, and you'll see me there. It's time for Late Night Craft Talk. With hosts Savea Kamori Yang and James Hermes. This week's guest we have back, amateur astronomer Curtis Youngberg for part two of his interview and we'll be talking about the planet Mars tonight. When the rover Perseverance recently landed on Mars just a few weeks ago, its first call back to NASA was in Science Data or Pictures. It was a call asking NASA if they'd like to extend their auto warranty. It's time to start the show. Do, 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 do. Why is my camera not turning on? I don't know. <laughs> well. Why is my, oh, there we go. Stuff. Okay, let me like angle it better. I got to see you better. Hold on. <laughs> Those what? glasses are so wacky. Oh my goodness. Oh, I'm still wearing the costume from the cold open. They're just so cool. <laughs> that folks, that, yeah. that was, uh, we made that up that cold open about five minutes before the show started. That was fun. Yeah. All right. We just kind of wanted to introduce the concept of uh, orbiters, landers, and rovers. All right, how are you doing, Savannah? I'm doing good. We've been working really hard at Dancing Bear. We're getting everyone fit in for their appointments. So we've had been very busy. And then not only that, we've been just sending out so many orders. I think we just have been just overwhelmed. It's been crazy. This week has just been a very busy week. And um, of course we have our drum class in June with James. So guys, remember you can sign up for that. It is actually an awesome class. If you like watching the show, you'll probably like the drum class because James is very entertaining as not. Um, rawhide is pulled and, pulled and tightened with rawhide and your arms are like tired from pulling and you know, all that rawhide. So anyway. <laughs> You're kind of like superimposing your experience. I know, right? Just Don't so ever they make, say your arms are tired from the drum class. Don't we're ever make that. more than two hand drums in one sitting. I'm just telling you. <laughs> but yeah, so we um, we are very excited about that coming up. And hey, James, what's been going on with Elk Rack Traders? <laughs> oh, this has been a busy week. Spring bag wholesales, whatnot. Uh, whoo, 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 whoo. Folks, when you order us from, remember, we're small businesses. And if you order at four o'clock in the afternoon, we're probably not going to be able to ship it out the same day. We try Even our damn really I got to. some orders to ship out tomorrow morning, but uh, not much to say. Been the same old, same old, just working. Uh, you know, appreciate everybody's business. I love talking to customers. I had a great conversation with a customer, two customers yesterday that kind of dragged into the day, but I love the conversation. I'm like, well, I'll just be less sleep tonight, but it's all for a good reason. Much right there to say, but you know, we but to get back to Sabea's drum class, you get have a chance to see Sabea and I in one place at the drum class, making what I like to call boom booms. Yeah, I try not to interrupt him too much though, because uh, he pretty much, you know, should probably give in, be giving some good information about the class. You know, well, here's Sabea when she we were doing the class last time here. Well, actually, a couple of years ago, Sabea's like, "Hey, Jim's," I go boom with the hand drum. You're like, and then she tries to talk. I go boom, boom, boom. 
and she's going, and I go, boom, 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 boom. And she's going, I was going to say your pants are on fire, but you know, I'll just walk away. And I'm going, yes. whoops. Yes. It's so funny. I thought it was. <laughs> Come on, just humor me and laugh a little bit now. Cause you know, I, otherwise you kill my self esteem and I'll be like this the rest of the show. Oh, look at the top of my hat. Yeah. But you know, right. it's a lot of fun. It is. Last All right, shall we move on for tonight's highlight? Yeah, let's do that. Tonight, folks, we're bringing back Curtis Youngberg. Tonight is about Mars. Matter of fact, Savea's in orbit. I'm on the planet, but I'm good because, uh-oh, I don't have a mask. Oh, yeah, you should probably be wearing a respirator. I mean, the air is pretty thin out there. I'm good now. Oh, we're going to learn just okay. how thin. All right, folks, let's okay. introduce this week's, let's go introduce our favorite guest this week coming back for part two welcome curtis youngberg back to late night craft talk yay thank you for having me guys not curtis welcome pleasure to be back it's gonna be a lot of fun i'm gonna enjoy it this okay hey, james, so we have it, an really quick james yes. is it on gallery view let me do that right quick uh yeah we're good i'm watching because okay. i got the live feed in this Hot tech computer window with <laughs> computer zoom here and sure. interface here, right here out in the open field of Mars. Yay. So thank you, Curtis, for joining well, us again. It's really been great working with you on well, this episode. You. And we've been enjoying hearing, I've been enjoying hearing you guys like totally geek out and be talking like crazy mm -hmm. about science. And, and I'm like, oh my gosh, this is like beyond, it's been so many years since I studied astronomy. Well, if you don't yeah. learn something new, then it's time wasted. So I'd love to get you guys to learn something new today. Yay! All right. Let me get rid of this. Matter of <laughs> fact, this wouldn't be astronomy per se. This would be planetary sciences. It's like you can't take yourself seriously when you're wearing those funny glasses. Yeah, no kid. <laughs> well, if that's the case, <laughs> Put well, back it'll on. be an off and on thing tonight. Put it that way. All right. <laughs> Should we jump into it? Yes, let's sure go thing. for it. Okay. So we're going to give a quick overview of Mars and a brief history of Mars exploration to build up to what we're talking about, where Savannah's going to go, this is pretty cool, but Curtis and I are going to be going, geek, 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 geek out. We're going to be talking about uh, perseverance and ingenuity mm -hmm. and some of the science of Mars. So let's go and get this part started. Let me gear it up. I got this whole little, like, little like, page-long speech here right here. So let me get it queued here for everybody. And so many buttons out here in this field on Mars. Well, you got all the room to have them. Do so. it. I got a whole planet. Yeah. And if I run out didn't of parts. You, didn't you remote program there. it though? Like you what? remote programmed it, right? What? You remote programmed your space transmission. No. Oh, okay. All right. Just for your ask. I'm just going off pure instinct of what you might say because there's an eight minute delay between what I'm saying now and what you see live. I'm just that <laughs> damn good. <laughs> Hey, that's timing okay. right there. <laughs> Absolutely. Uh huh. Yeah. Okay. I guess <laughs> I'm not that perfect at it. <laughs> okay, folks, let's do a quick overview of Mars. Okay. A brief history of Mar exploration on Mars. Mars, the third rock from the sun and second smallest planet in the solar system, named after the Roman god of war, Mars is referred to as the red planet. Mars has a diameter of 4,212 miles, an orbital period of 687 days, that's basically a year, on a Martian year, and the length of the typical Martian day is 24 hours and 37 minutes. Its average distance from the sun is 141.6 million miles, its mass is 11% that of the Earth, and its gravity is 38% that of the Earth. If you want to lose weight quick, go to Mars. Scientists have always been intrigued by Mars. Since 1960, humanity launched dozens of missions to Mars to learn, about, to learn more about our planetary neighbor whose surface looks like a lot like the desert of Utah. There is a high failure rate with sending spacecraft to Mars, as you can see from the graphic here, uh, with some 60% being a 60% fail, failure rate, which if you want to look at that as a gl half glass full, it's a 40% uh, success rate. Yep, those NASA type people are smart, but sending an inter interplanetary probe to a different planet involves extremely complex engineering. 
in the 1960s, the former Soviet Union was the first country to try to send a spacecraft to Mars to, for a flyby, not orbit, but a flyby. Called the Marsnik and Sputnik, each, space, each spacecraft either blew up during launch or malfunctioned on their way to Mars. The United States early missions also failed, but in 1965, the NASA spacecraft Mariner 4 finally made a successful flyby of Mars, returning for the first time 21 close-up photos of the surface of Mars. And judging from those photos, yes, we have come a long way since 1965. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay. In 1971, the Soviet Union finally met with success after several attempts to reach the Red Planet. Its Mars 2 orbiter arrived in 1971. Mind you, this, well, the disco was a few years later. However, the Mars 2 lander crashed on the surface and was no longer operable. Mars 3, a lander and orbiter, which is the satellite that orbits Earth, and then a lander that goes down, as if you watch the beginning of the show, you know what a lander is now, uh, launched on May, 8th, 20, May 28, 1971, and arrived on the Red Planet on December 3rd of that same year. The lander worked for only a few seconds on the surface before failing, but the orbiter was successful. It worked successfully. Everything changed in Mars exploration when NASA's Mariner 9 landed in November 1971. The spacecraft arrived when the entire planet was engulfed in a dust storm. Pictures showed a mysterious object sticking out of the plumes of the dust. When the, form, the storm finally settled on the surface, scientists discovered those unusual features were actually the tops of dormant volcanoes. Mariner 9 also discovered a huge rift across the surface of Mars, later called Valles Marineris, which is named after the Mariner spacecraft. Mariner 9 orbited the red planet for a year and returned 7,329 photos of the surface, some of which you see right here in the slide. Um, during the first half of the 1970s, the USSR sent several more spacecraft with landers that met with partial success, but mostly failed. In 1975, NASA sent Viking 1 and 2, and these are cool. Both, and both arrived in 1976. Each sent their lander to the surface while the orbiter remained working above. The Viking program represented the first extended exploration of Mars and transmitted reams of information back to Earth. But hopes of finding life on the red planet, however, were dashed when the probes could not definitively prove the existence of microbes on the surface. Though the results remain controversial to this day because over time we've begun to understand more about microbial life and microbial activity. In 1997, NASA's Mars Global Survey arrived at Mars and mapped the red planet from pole to pole, it revealing many past signs of water on the surface of the planet. Mars Global Surveyor took many interesting pictures of the surface of Mars, including reimagining the famous face of Mars, which I was going to have a funny slide of, but ran out of time. We'll go back to that later in the show. Yeah, that stirred up a lot of controversy. Oh, yeah, never mind. We finally got to a higher res image. And, you know, it's like, oh, it doesn't look like a face because, you know, it's the difference between the 1965 picture and, say, 2021. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> the NASA Pathfinder missions, these cool little toy cars we sent in the 90s, the NASA Pathfinder and the Sojourner rovers arrived in Mars in July of 1997. The lander was the first to use a set of airbags to cushion the landing, and Sojourner was the first to first rover to trundle around on Mars. Pathfinder was expected to last about a month and Sojourner a week, but both remained in operation until September of 1997 when contact was lost with Pathfinder. In 1999, two more NASA missions failed when the Mars Climate, Climate Orbiter and the Mars Polar Lander both malfunctioned upon reaching orbit of the Red Planet. Here we get to the fun stuff, the really, really fun stuff. NASA's Mars Odyssey arrived at the Red Planet on October 24th, 2001. The orbiter is still conducting its extended science, still conducting its extended science mission. It broke the record for the longest serving spacecraft at Mars on December 15th, 2010. The European Space Agency launched its lander orbiter called the Mars Express Beagle 2 on June 2nd, 2003. The lander was lost on arrival on December 25th, 2003 but the orbiter completed its prime mission in November of 05 and is currently on an extended mission still. That's a heck of a good shelf life. Matter of fact, should be talking about their extended warranty. 
Yeah, no kidding. Our standard auto warranty. That's actually a really good, uh, really good investment there. <laughs> oh yeah. So we have a uh, NASA's two rovers, Spirit and Opportunity, were sent to the surface of Mars in 2004. Each discovered ample evidence that water once flowed on the red planet. Spirit died in a sand dune in March 2010. Will Opportunity continue to work for nearly another decade? Opportunity fell silent during a sandstorm in summer of 2018, and NASA declared the mission over in 2019. So this is only like till two years ago. Yeah, op Opportunity Three. only went quiet real, real recently. It lasted a long time. Oh yeah, heck of a funny. Is they call them twin rovers. They they were both built pretty much the same way, one versus the other. Yeah, but they both landed on complete opposite sides of the planet. Like they were nowhere close to each other. Nope. But good old USA engineering. Yep. All right. Another NASA orbiter, the Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter, launched on August 12, 2005. It began orbiting the planet on, in March of 2006. The mission was, has returned more data than all previous Mars missions combined and continues to send high-resolution data for the red planet uh, with feature, uh, red planet's features and weather. And now we get to the next to the last probe that landed on there, Curiosity. NASA's powerful rover Curiosity arrived on Gale Crater in 2012 to search for signs of ancient habitable environments. Its major findings include finding previously water-soaked areas, detecting methane on the surface, and finding organic compounds. It is still going strong in 2021, but look at those tires, dude. Oh, yeah, they got beat up. Oh, yeah. Mars is two moons, Deimos and Phobos. Whoops. Apparently that slide didn't get in there. Let me double check. Nope. Okay. We're going to get past that. Well, coincidentally so, though, but while we're talking about that is Deimos and Phobos are now the two names of SpaceX's um, ocean launch facilities that they're going to be setting up for Starship. So that's what he's officially naming them. He's naming them after the moons of Mars. So I thought that was really cool. That is. Cool. Okay. Just to finish off is the, uh, just a cool, cool little note is that Deimos and Phobos we covered earlier in the show are actually like asteroids that have been caught by Mars and now become small moons. Not like Earth's moon, which is unusually huge considering the size of Earth and its moon. Usually moons are much smaller compared to their parent body they orbit. It's almost uh, a quarter of our size. Yeah, it's nuts. Jeez. So uh, Deimos and Phobos, both are thought to be asteroids, that, as I commented, but there have actually been other missions by the Soviet Union and the United States to try to land a probe on one of Mars moons, Phobos, and each one has failed because that is crazy difficult. No yeah. I think it's like Deimos is moving really fast close in. Yeah, it's orbiting once every couple of days, I think. Gotcha. There's one I think it, is, it must be, if that's Phobos, I think it's Deimos, the one that, that orbits like once every like eight hours. I'm shooting from the hip. I'm probably way off, but it's like really a crazy short orbital time. And Curtis is reading something. I am reading something. One second. Okay. Is this a oh, wow. uh, Yeah. Let's see. Phobos orbits once every 11 hours. And yeah, I thought it was quick. Mars is once every, or excuse me, Deimos is once every 130 hours. So that, that one's like three or four, no, more than that. It's like almost six days. Wow. That's, That's fast. Crazy. Where's your camera? Uh, my camera is off because I was fiddling, fiddling with my computer. Does that mean now? you're actually like holding a bow up in your computer or a bow to your computer? <laughs> well, my computer is starting to restart now, so I'm I'm looks like it looks pretty positive that I'll have my computer back in a few minutes. <laughs> Dang you, like evil 20. mistress technology. <laughs> yeah. Whoops. Gotcha. So yeah. That's really it's really interesting information about um how much we've tried to go to Mars and tried to find out a lot of information about mars well, you know, uh, don't yawn too much there survey on the camera i know i need to get some caffeine <laughs> well as we talk about this we there's been a lot of mars exploration now i mean there's still so much to learn but one of the things that really we we've, we've one way we've been able to get there more reliably is through imagination via the entertainment industry yes yep, mars movies is it time to talk about our favorite mars movies Absolutely. Absolutely. Oh, how fun. Let's we go like ahead and share Mars movies. Let's me go ahead and introduce that part of the show. And here we go. 
So everybody, we'd like to introduce yep. and talk about, since we got off the whole like brainy thing of like dates and stuff of Mars exploration, here's our late favorite Mars movies. I'll start with mine and we'll go to Sevea's. We all agree, definitely, The Martian. Pretty cool movie. Martian was one of the best Mars centered movies that I've seen, like as far as production quality, like most of the science is on point. It, it was beautiful. It was great. And I, and I like to paraphrase it for these shows. We're going to send science the heck out of things. Going to science the heck out of things. Yep. I got to nice. keep it clean because we have kids to watch the show. All right. <laughs> nice. So our next movie, because I mean, what's what's all right. I got to do the Matt Damon joke. It's not quite trite yet. We spent all this money and time and men to go find him in World War II. Now mm -hmm. we got to spend billions upon billions of dollars to try to rescue Matt Damon on Mars. <laughs> he just keeps getting himself into trouble. We got to start <laughs> putting him on lockdown here on earth or something we'd be better off i'm reckoning yeah, all, right. all right next movie we have is got people some people are gonna say god help me yes i like john carter <laughs> this is such a weird movie okay James, it was I'm, weird but it was good I enjoyed it. It. it was good it was be it's better than the reputation gives it than people to bash yeah. it it's mm -hmm. based off the book the princess of mars and some other books along those lines so they just shorted it to john carter and kind of got butchered but the movie is itself i, I enjoyed it all right, ding so dong, we have the next ding dong. What ding dong? What ding dong? What's ding dong? What happened? What's ding dong? What's ding dong? What's... Means she was able to. Uh, oh, she was signing in from her laptop because it finally restarted. Yay! Hoorah. There we go. I'm like, thank goodness! Oh my goodness! Can well, look at this. Out of all this, our our our, our guest is the only one on Earth. All right. <laughs> <laughs> all right, we have. John Carter. We also have this one's a this one's the makes you think the most at any of them is Ad Astra. I don't want to give it away. Yes, because unfortunately I haven't seen it yet. Dude, I'm totally sending you a present on this. Okay. Um, Ad Astra it takes a much different view. It, it it involves multiple planets. It takes it out throughout the solar system, but a chunk of it is on Mars. Uh, it is a very high brow very intellectual movie i like it for a lot of its concepts and the fact that a lot of these movies look for life on other planets while they're looking outward while ad astra looks inward mm -hmm. it is uh it took a while it took a while for me to appreciate it and it's still an ongoing process and yeah, now honorable I mention goes to zombies of the stratosphere oh yeah these are zombies Classic. from the planet mars but never yeah. mind, it says zombies of the stratosphere. Yeah. Okay. You know, I was going to say something on the previous movie. Was Brad Pitt in that movie? Yes. Yes, he was. Okay, then maybe I might watch it. Uh, <laughs> Brad Pitt, and it's also got, uh, what's the guy that plays his father in the movie? Tommy Lee Jones. Tommy Lee Jones, yeah. Really? Yeah. Was, As a lot of people got Chris Sutherland. Either. Donald Sutherland. It's got Donald Sutherland. Oh, Donald Sutherland. I'm like, oh, I don't really Tommy see Lee's him. in it too. But I don't see Tommy Lee as his dad. That's be weird. I don't know. Um, I'm pretty sure Tommy Lee Jones is in this too because a lot of people were, a Tommy lot of people who didn't know about it. it thought this was a continuation of the movie Space Cowboys because freaking Tommy Lee's character at the end of the movie, spoilers, spoiler alert, uh, heads off to the moon and doesn't return. So a lot of people thought this was some kind of a continuation of that when it isn't. Uh, uh, I will say this is that Tommy Lee Jones is nothing like his character in Space Cowboys. And God, that movie sucked. Okay. Uh, okay. <laughs> All right. Savannah, your turn. Yay. So my, one of my favorites, uh, I love this director. Uh, he has directed a movie that I really love, Nightmare Before Christmas. And I know someone here hasn't watched Nightmare Before Christmas before ever. Curtis. I've ever. seen it. Ever. Well, okay, then I don't know who Savea is talking about. Okay, so actually, this picture is kind of funny because it looks like a whole bunch of broccoli. That's why I thought it was kind of a funny picture. But yeah, this movie is really an interesting movie. It's funny, it's tongue in cheek, and it's based on the old comic books. And uh, I think, you know, I was reading about it because of what we were bringing about the show is that um, they did find that um, there was a couple other renditions of attempts of trying to do this movie, but it was just impossible without the CGI. And so but because of the CGI, they actually made a really cool movie. And it's really cool. I really liked it. I loved how 
it was just very inventive. And I loved how you could see all the cameos. It was so much fun. Oh, yeah. Jack Nicholson, Glenn Close, Lynette Benning, Pierce Brosnan, Danny DeVito. Yeah. Yes. Oh, and then I love that at the very end, how they win the war against the aliens. Wait, should I say anything? I'm probably going to, I'm going to probably spoil it. For Don't people. give away the movie that's been out over okay. 20. Okay. Okay. So at the very end, <laughs> you're going to be like, that's so funny. It makes me laugh. So when you watch it, you'll like think of me saying, that is just too funny how they ended that show. This is too funny. <laughs> After a certain amount of time, do you think it's like okay to point out that the boat sank at the end of Titanic? <laughs> yeah. That kind of thing. I'm thinking picking metaphor. Oh, about. I have a really funny thing to tell you about the Titanic movie. Okay, so I know this is totally off topic, but it's really funny. So my I go to, I probably watched it like four or five times in the theaters back then, like because we loved that movie, right? And I go with my sister and her friend. And it's the really pivotal moment where the boat is tipping up and there's people holding onto the rails mm -hmm. and like you know, my sister's friend. I mean, this, this was just so funny how she reacted. She's crying. She's like, oh. <laughs> she's crying and, and like all these, you know, it's really sad. And then this person falls from the back of the boat and hits the rudder and she starts laughing hysterically. <laughs> and then starts crying again. <laughs> just like hearing that, I'm sorry, it just like totally brought back a funny memory of watching that movie and how it went from pure crying to hysterical laughter to pure crying again. So anyway. Well, I'll, I'll do you a favor and I'll make it not so off topic because there is something about that movie that's slightly astronomy based. When the movie was first released, uh, during that same scene you're talking about where the, the stern of the ship was coming up out of the water, uh, the stars in the night sky of the original release were not accurate to the place and the time. And that got so much of an uproar from the scientific community that finally on the re-release, uh, James Cameron, he um, he finally did it right. right. He fixed it. He made it accurate to the time, accurate wow. to the Atlantic. He did, he did everything right. Wow. Wow. That's craziness. They did that for Perkhard's Vineyard in Star Trek The Next Generation when he was supposed to be in that year. And they made the uh, Orion... Uh, layout right from that from that area in that time right in the evening ah. i like i like those little attention to detail things yeah such a little attention to detail like a really little attention to detail but yeah. only a few people be like oh the, the only movie that ever gets it right with all the details you can think of is zombies from the stratosphere mm, yeah. really well it was the science we know at the time right yeah, 1951. So so um, in our comments, uh, Jen saying that the cover looks so disgusting for uh, Mars Attacks because it looks like, and she said, it looks, she said, I hate brains. Well, that's why she explains the show. That, that movie, like, if you don't like that, then, I mean, you'll see brains the entire time because their heads are in this glass jar and their brains are visible. So, yeah. Yeah, they have uh, no skull. It's like all brain. That. It's like, e you have me also wanting to warn her don't watch the movie hannibal okay oh then probably a good idea yeah so jen yes. don't watch hannibal don't watch mars attacks because i think that you'll be traumatized yeah yeah won't be that pleasant for you yeah okay so we got it we we have another section are we ready to do we've talked about all the mars or exploration we ready to get to the nitty-gritty here and talk about uh overview of perseverance and ingenuity sure thing all right. Cool. Oh wait, so, wait, Curtis. Did you have any movies you wanted to share? Uh, no, we pretty much we pretty much hit them. The Martian is right up there at the top of my list, so we, it's a shared favorite there. <laughs> Jen right. says, "I just don't watch that part in Hannibal." <laughs> it is an ugly scene. <laughs> All right, let's go from Hannibal to uh, Perseverance and Ingenuity. So, okay, so I'm gonna I go ahead and play this better. Huh? JPL actually put out a video earlier today uh, giving an update on Perseverance and Ingenuity, the pairing on like how they're going to launch it. So it's a quick little three minute video, or not even that, it's like two minute, 40 second, uh, straight from the horse's mouth, they can let us know what, what their plan is and moving forward. So I thought we'd give a watch of that real quick, if you guys don't mind. Yeah, let me, let me, I'm, I'm actually in the maneuvers of co-hosting you right quick and Sabaya. Yes, I do want to make him co-host. Sabaya, I'm also co-hosting you right quick. Okay, thank you. All right, we're set. Okay. 
Uh, floor is yours, Curtis. Thank you. Thank you. And here we go. So, is there sound? So can you just? If you want to stop sharing? You might have to click uh, share sound. Search just share system sound. Oh, can you guys not hear the audio on there? Yeah. yeah, there's no audio. We can't hear it. So once you unshare, and for one, when we write, when you go back in there, uh, click from 1080p audio to 720. It's going to stream better across Zoom. And stop sharing, and then go ahead, and you'll click to see the option that says. Uh, Share sound. All right. Well, maybe maybe we won't watch the video then. You can just reshare. No, that's all right. Share, dude. We'll just Thank go you. ahead and uh, talk about what it's talking about, basically. Uh, right now, they're in the process of, with Ingenuity, the helicopter, and they're in the process of trying to find the spot where they're going to deploy it. Uh, once they do, it's they got to find a nice flat area, but they also want to find a place with a lot of uh, diversity in and in features, so that way the camera that's on board of Ingenuity can actually see what the heck it's doing. So, and it's gonna take uh, about two to three weeks for it to fully deploy off of Perseverance. Right now, the helicopter Ingenuity is still horizontal on the underbelly of Perseverance, uh, which is where it was when, it, when we sent it out and when it uh, entered the atmosphere. And it's just gonna steadily, step by step, go vertical. And then the final step is it's gonna drop it down onto the planet. After it does that, Perseverance is going to drive off about 300 feet away to keep itself nice and safe in case Ingenuity goes haywire. And uh, they're going to have their first flight. It's scheduled for early April this year. It's only a couple of weeks away. That's so awesome. Only a couple of weeks. Oh, I can't wait, dude. <laughs> but just so people know, um, some people aren't aware that there is a basically a helicopter underneath, in, underneath Perseverance. Yeah, bolted to them. So um, you know, it's carried underneath. If anybody gets a chance, Google it. It's just neat to see that you can see the, where the blades, rotor blades are at and everything for it. But uh, is there, you want to let us know a little bit more about in, uh, in about uh, Ingenuity? Sure. Um, first off, the challenge of Ingenuity is first, it's just a technology demonstration. All, of it's, all it's doing is just to prove that we know enough about flight to send a powered aircraft on it and take off and successfully maneuver around. The challenge of that I think we noted it before, is the density of the atmosphere. We're spoiled here on Earth. The air is nice and thick. It's almost soupy compared to, compared to Mars. Um, here's a good demonstration for it. Say this here, if you take a look at it, I'll try and get it all in a frame. This is a one perfect cubic foot of air. Say this represents Martian atmosphere. And to put in size comparison, just so you can see, here's a soda bottle inside the square. Yeah. So you can see about how big the sucker is. Yeah. Okay. I, I have the same soda bottle. No kidding. Whoa, psychic. Yeah. Orange uh, vanilla? Orange vanilla Coke. Yep, that's good stuff, oh. isn't it? <laughs> so say this is the air on Mars. If we captured this perfectly and brought it back to Earth, that volume of air would only take up this much space. That's how different the air is on Earth versus Mars. That's how much thinner the air is up there. So because of that, helicopters on Earth, they only have, the rotors on them only have to spend like four and a half, 500 RPM in order to be able to take off. Mm -hmm. Ingenuity is gonna have to go up to 2,500 to 3,000 RPM in order to just wow. lift its four pound frame. Wow. But it's gonna have to try a lot harder just to get like 10 feet off the ground, but that's all it's meant to do. About 10, 15 feet is the highest it's ever gonna get. Wow. I know what the batteries, the batteries it has, cause it's having to run off lithium ion batteries because uh, it's got the solar panels recharge. Um, actually, how's that work? How's the recharge of batteries for different flights? Because it, it does, they only fly it does like recharge, 90 seconds at a time, right? Yeah, 90 second flight is the longest it'll ever do. And there's a reason for that. It could actually do longer, but they don't want to use up all the power for one specific reason because it's stinking cold on Mars. And if they don't have a way of keeping ingenuity like to temp and not freezing over, it's going to fail before it even takes off. So they have to have a way of keeping it from like keeping the electronics, keeping everything in, in the fuselage and the internals of the helicopter, they got to keep it thawed out. So part of the energy use that that solar panel on top is going to use is just to keep it toasty. 
Wow. Just so it can survive at night. Because at night, I think it gets down to 130, 140 degrees below zero Fahrenheit. Oh my God, that's so cold. Yeah. That's like wow. beyond Alaska at its worst. Yeah. Or Southern Californian. Yeah. And that's not windshield, guys. No, that's not, that's not windshield. That's, that's straight like up. That's standard. That's, yeah. <laughs> so that so would that's, be interesting because, you know, if you think about, oh, I have a mountain, I have a gray mountain behind me. It just comes and goes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, but it's like if you're to, if you try to think about humans living in Mars, it would be challenging because of the air being very thin. And not also, only is the air thin, but it's also 95% carbon dioxide. So even if it was as dense as this, we still wouldn't be able to breathe it. There's not enough oxygen in there for us to do any good with it. So. Oxygen. And plus it gets very, very cold. Mm hmm so yeah, you'd have to come up with a way of heating yourself and you'd have to come up with a way of taking your own air with you. And then also you were talking about the, when you were talking about the density of the air earlier, about how when it's windy there, it's not windy. Yeah. I mean, it could be, it could, the wind could be blowing at like a hundred mile an hour, but it could feel like it's just a gentle breeze against your skin because it's so thin. It has no weight to it. It's just, it'll sit there and just flutter against you. Yeah. What, what I think if you, the equivalent on earth, the you know the higher you go the, le the less dense the air is uh if you were going to go up you would have to go up so high to uh have the same density as mars's atmosphere at its at mars's surface you'd have to go to, i think an elevation of 100,000 feet correct 110,000 yeah 110,000 it's, it's up there <laughs> yeah is there any higher than higher Earth? than any jet flies any commercial jet airliner flies so there's no place as higher as high that on as high as that on the earth you have to fly it yeah, you'd have to fly up there. You can't walk up to a spot that's that thin. Uh, and, and even then, that is higher than the U-2 or the SR-71, mm -hmm. officially. Yeah. And I think when, uh, when um, what's his name? I forget the guy's name that was, uh, that jumped, uh, it was called the Stratosphere or whatever. Yeah, yeah, the he Red Bull Red jump Bull. guy. Yeah. Yeah. What he only went name? up to about 80, what, 75 Long or Gardner or something was his name? Huh? Was Felix it like, Paul. Yeah. It was Felix Baumeister like was actually the guy that did in the late '60s. What was it? I'm gonna have yeah. to look that up now. <laughs> and then he, and then this other guy. Well, we'll have to Google it right quick. Somebody, any, any of our viewers, if you can look this up for us and let us know the guy's name that just, just like in the last ten years, um, that did that was a jump that was sponsored by Red Bull. But I think they only he only went up to like I think he went up to like ninety five or hundred thousand. Yeah, he wasn't even at this range. He had to wear a spacesuit. Yeah, he had to wear a pressurized spacesuit in order for him to survive. Otherwise, his body would have, uh, his blood would have boiled in his veins, basically. Yeah, and it was, yeah. it would have really Here, sucked. Looking up atmosphere jump. Oh yeah, the guy like, and it was in 2012. And let's see here, he, Felix Baumgartner, 39 km, 39 kilometers into the stratosphere over New Mexico. And look. If anybody looks that up, you'll see how it is. You can definitely see the curvature of the Earth. And imagine space doesn't begin until 100 kilometers up. Wow. Which is roughly about 60 miles. Wow. Yeah, which is higher than he was when he did that jump. Much higher. So that's how thin the air is on Mars. It's Got it. Yeah, they definitely show him in a spacesuit. I think that's probably smart of him. Oh, it's pretty incredible what he did. And you know what? There's a, what's funny is not, I think, what, just a year or two later, less than two years later, there was a guy that did it on a budget and went higher than him by like 10 or 15,000 more feet. Mm -hmm. And this, you know, uh, there's all these cameras and this guy basically did it on a budget. And I mean, still, he was one of, he was a, one of the founders of Microsoft or Google, he served on the original board. So he's got lots of money, but wow you know you, you look at him you, the, the guy that did it in 2012 he's like yeah i'm a man's man jock all that this guy was might as well have a set of point extra glasses on held together with first aid tape, tape on yeah. the nose <laughs> wow he's like i'm not a brave man but i'm gonna do this and he, he did bread bowl pretty wow. cool all right it's crazy so we've talked about the helicopter i know that like what the blades are like four feet long they're made of carbon fiber yeah, they're the foam core plane. carbon fiber. And just to give another little um, reference, they are literally that long. That is how long the, let me get it in one frame, see if I can. That's how long the props are in diameter. Wow. And they wow. got to spin at about 3000 RPMs just for a four pound fuselage. That's literally only about that big. 
Yeah, and it's two opposing ones just for, just for stability in the atmosphere. Yeah, counter rotating. It's something yeah, counter -rotating. that a lot of uh, helicopters and prop based uh, aircraft do here on Earth. It counters the rotation of one prop with another, so that way it's more stable. Gotcha. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, we've covered ingenuity. It is a it's what's what was called a showcase technology. Yeah, a technology demonstration. A technology demonstration. I think we might want to turn our, our attention to the big dog right there. The actual, you know. Absolutely. The big you know, dog we, is perseverance. As we much talked as it is about to have a helicopter on another planet. Yeah, we talked about uh, bringing our own air with us, but in, uh, perseverance has actually got something on board there as well. That's an experiment that mm -hmm. can help us make our own breathable air there. It's called Moxie, which is a uh, basically an oxygen generator using carbon dioxide that's in the atmosphere. It's an experiment to see if we can create our own breathable air, and as well as uh, fuel source for eventual return missions from Mars to Earth using the atmosphere on Mars. So okay. that's, on that's on board. They're going to try that a few times and see if they can uh, get that to work as well. Wow, that's cool. There's a lot going on in this mission. Wow. Yeah, even then, and um, you know, it's basically bigger, better, better than uh, anything that Curiosity did. Yeah, pretty much. You know, I mean, it's, a, it's the same basic design. It's that they took Curiosity's basic design, the the landing system, the entry descent landing system, as well as like the basic fuselage and all that, and the power system as well. They basically copied and pasted it and just made it better so that this can be more successful. Like the wheels are slightly thinner. They're made out of a higher grade aluminum alloy. So that way they'd be more durable. Like we mentioned, when we saw Curiosity, the wheels were all banged up. Yeah. Well, they're, they're trying to avoid that with this one. So well, it's like if anybody can see where my picture behind her, it's hard to see on the image, but those big nasty tires i mean you might as well call those recaps from ludlow yeah pretty much <laughs> they are busted up tires wow. um and we lost nope and sorry. our is back okay. <laughs> sorry uh i mean yeah some of the engineering that goes into this especially with the new technology the upgraded laser the cameras everything it's just bigger it's curiosity bigger better i think only it weighs like it weighs like what six or eight hundred more pounds than curiosity about yeah yeah, and I think I should probably go like this just so people can get reference right here. That's Curiosity. That's a picture from like six months ago. Yeah, actually, I've got another photo I can show you guys that oh, kind of illustrates the size difference between all these different rovers all in one image. So one second. Okay. Oh, that's cool. Oh, yeah. No, it's seeing this definitely puts it into perspective. Uh, where'd that go? Where'd that picture go? Well, the fact is, is that while you're doing that, I think it's worth pointing, pointing out that it's a much rougher territory than where Curiosity landed. Oh yeah, and it's got a it's got a, it's got a fair amount of autonomy that it can drive itself. Or Curiosity you still have to take it go tell it go two feet this way this way. All right, let's get the graph. Look at that. So you got that's actually Perseverance on the right. You have a model of Spirit and Opportunity on the left, and Sojourner is that little tiny rover on the, in the front. These are actually models that they built so that way if they needed to troubleshoot anything on the rover themselves, they have a model here on Earth that they can work with. So that way they have a better idea of what they're doing. That's cool. And those scientists. Those are scientists. Why are they not wearing spacesuits right now? Personally, I'm actually okay with it because they're wearing jeans and sneakers. And if I was a scientist, I'd still be wearing that too. So that's my okay. style. They're not wearing jackets. How are they surviving on Mars? I know because look at the background, they kind of have it looking like in a natural environment, like it's on Mars. Like they yeah, even have yeah. some lava rocks and different things. Oh, yeah. There's probably like a huge, like a big building right behind them that's like very industrial looking. And it's kind of funny because like they angled the photo so you couldn't see it. Yeah, they shaped well, the building to look like the face on Mars too, just to keep it more realistic. No, not really. <laughs> right. Well, we said during pre during the pre show we wouldn't go there. Well, here we are. Here we are. <laughs> <laughs> it, had, right. it had to come up at least once. Oh yeah, oh yeah. It's just too too can't resist that low hanging fruit. Nope. All right. So we've got a couple clips, a video clips of uh, perseverance. We've got one where it's. Um, let me take a look here. We got where it's, one where it's landed, which we've watched in the show, but I don't know if you want to cover that right there because part of the just the crazy engineering that went into launch this thing the size of a car. I know it's the size of a VW out. bus. The thing is uh, nine feet front to back, eight feet left to right, and it's seven feet tall when its camera mass is fully extended upward. Yeah, it's a VW bus. Yeah, it's a VW bus. Um, one thing that is special about Perseverance that Curiosity didn't have, 
Curiosity's got a couple of cameras on there. They're really low res ones for navigational purposes, but they're not really like good high res cameras. Mm -hmm. Perseverance has 19 cameras on board. Wow. 19 different cameras of different spectrums, different ways that it can take in light, take in images for uh, research purposes and whatnot. And yeah, this sucker is basically a roving Olympus camera. <laughs> wow. That's cool. A lot of and us like big, pretty pictures. A lot of us like big, pretty pictures. And the one thing that that allowed the benefit of us to have, and James, you're going to share this here in the video that you're going to show, is this is the first time we actually got to see live video of the process of entry, descent, and landing, or as they call it in Smart Talk, EDL. Mm. Smart Talk. Smart Talk. Okay. I'll go ahead and queue up the video right quick. If you want to go ahead and uh, talk us through what's going on. Sure. And. Um, Okay, we got the slide right here, and let me get the video going. It's going to be about a minute and a half long, so well, we talked about it. You've uh, you you know where the, I've, I've edited it, so yeah, yeah. Here's the video. Alpha in the cage. Shoot so the that parachute, when it was packed into the, the has capsule, that the parachute was has packed deployed as tight as a block of wood. That's how dense it was when they were able to pack it in, and it basically fired out of there like a mortar. It was a very explosive event. And there's the heat shield dropping away. It's This is past the hottest part of entry. It's already gone in the atmosphere and it's slowed down. So no longer needs a heat shield. Get rid of it. Unfortunately, what we don't get to see is the heat shield hitting the ground. It goes just off scene right, right there is about the last time you see it. I totally wanted to see that. I wanted to see it too so bad. Oh, yeah. That would have been cool. Now, at this point, uh, Perseverance has actually got cameras. Uh, well, obviously, it's got cameras pointing on the ground since we're seeing this, but it's using the imagery coupled with a map that it already has installed on its software. And it's using that to figure out where it's going to land. It doesn't know exactly where it's going to land yet. Just like kind of, I didn't know where I was going to land during the eclipse back in 2017. Kind of same idea. It just went from the hip. Here we are approaching the surface. And now you're starting to see the dust go away. That's from the rockets of the uh, sky crane. It's now hovering. And it's going to lower perseverance down off cables. The cool thing is the imaging your images you're seeing here are being piped from that cord you're seeing in the image. That's a internet landline. That's a Ethernet cable. So all the cameras that are on the the sky crane module there are being directly piped down. And, and there the goes moment, the sky crane. Yep. As soon as you saw those other videos cut out, that's because that internet cable got severed and it was no longer transmitting video. And that little rocket crane just went shooting off in about I think two miles away and crash landed was it that far it landed it was 200 mi something miles. like that uh got wow. a picture of the map of the spread of everything gotcha well the fact is that we i mean that we could see that for the first time usually it's like okay instruments have said this will happen this has happened it's confirmed and now we actually get to see it and i think we, we talked about a couple weeks ago is that why are we not seeing any out of the rockets from the sky crane why are we not seeing flames? It's because they are, uh, let's see, what was, uh, it's the it's a hyperbolic fuel. So there is, it, it's like th uh, therazine, right? Something like that. Yeah. yeah. So it, 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 there is a flame, there is combustion going on, but it's so quick and so fast that all the combustion is happening within the motors. It's not coming out of the nozzle. There's no actual open flame that's going to be shooting out. So literally all you're looking at is hydrogen and uh, I think, I think hydrogen and oxygen, both of the two byproducts of getting shot out of those things. Yeah, just all that gas coming out that's keeping up. That's yeah, why it's, it's all just gas shooting out of that thing. And the, even even if there was oxygen in the atmosphere and there was there was flame, it's so thin. So thin, it's gone. Yeah, you won't see a flame running anyway. Nope. If it was going to combust anything in the atmosphere, but it's only putting into the atmosphere in that case. So gotcha. here's... Here's an overhead view of the entire landing area of Perseverance taken by the Mars Reconnaissance, Reconnaissance Orbiter. Okay. So you've got, there's the parachute in the back shell. That was the part that, like I said, with the mortar round that shot off the parachute that, that deployed in about less than a second. That landed over here. The descent stage, uh, which was the, um, the sky crane, the one that literally like lowered it down. That's where it landed there. The heat shield, landed way over here off to the east and then perseverance touched down right here you can actually even see in the image some of the dust trails kicked away from the sky crane blowing the stuff around like that's how good of an image they were able to capture of the wow. landing. 
Is that all ice? It looks like ice. It almost looks like ice, but it's just really clean dust that was blown away and cleaned out. So you're seeing some new rock face there. That's it. That's that's why it looks all yeah, white. It's, it's, it's just the black and white image. Yeah. Hmm. It, it's all red and orange and red. Yep. Okay. That's awesome. Yeah. Um, it had a microphone. Yeah, there's a microphone on the belly of the uh, Perseverance, right? So it's yes. getting like good recordings now. We actually do. Yeah. There was also a microphone on the descent stage, but unfortunately, when that uh, motor round went off, it destroyed the microphone. In fact, if mm. you looked really closely, when the parachute is launching out, you could see a little part flailing off into the distance. That's literally the microphone flying away. Ah. Uh, so Judging that was from like, what do you think that microphone costs? Maybe like a. Uh, a couple hundred thousand dollars to get up there yes but the part was uh off the shelf radio shack part <laughs> oh okay <laughs> cool and now we're talking vintage because radio shack's not really around anymore no it's not wolf maybe they bought out their stock <laughs> all i think is nasa really needs to talk about getting an extension on their auto warranty yep <laughs> <laughs> so we do have a video clip of the it was taken just the last what three or four days ago I think mm -hmm. of uh, perse uh, perseverance actually driving and the sound it produces while it drives. A lot of you out there try not to think when you hear the sound Indian car when you hear this. So let me let me go ahead and cue up the video. So let me get it up here. We got our next video clip and here is the sound. sound that bad yeah <laughs> lovely sound of aluminum on the rock oh yeah so that wasn't the greatest right there I just keep on thinking of Indian car. Yeah. I was thinking it was going to be, I was thinking, oh, it's probably going to be like when he, when James said Indian car, I was thinking it was like going to be more like kind of more, I don't even Bumper know. sticker holding the exhaust pipe on <laughs> the bumper or the bumper. I was thinking of the drum song, Indian car. That's exactly what I'm referring to. Yeah. But I wasn't thinking about Indian car. I was thinking about a drum song. So I'm thinking about. How is the drum song? It's not really a drum. Yeah. Well, there's a drum song, but about Indian car, but I'm talking, it's I think it's John Trottle that sang Indian the car, the song. Yes. Okay. I was thinking about the, the drum song. No, not, not, not that one. Cause that's a famous, that's a very famous hand drum song. Mm -hmm. But um, I'm thinking, like I said, the John, the car, but you know, let's just go with the stereotypical Indian car, the clunk, 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 clunk you hear all the undercarriage going. Yeah. Uh, what do you infer from that, Curtis? Uh, well, <laughs> the sound coming from another planet, like you'd think it would be a little bit more muffled, but no, it's pretty, it's a really rough environment. Like yeah. it puts into perspective how tough it is to get something to work out there. There's no comfort. There is no cushion. There is nothing. Well, so not to mention that is that we're going to, we're not going to hear things out there. Even with the thinness of the air, it's not going to sound the same as here on earth just because the acoustics of one, the gases two. Yep. the pressure three it's freaking mars freaking mars I, I think that they might be more concerned if they heard like some kind of weird noise like that was animal based or maybe something that was more like 
there was a bean talking or something in the background that may be a little more concerning. Well, there was one clip that featured a transformer going over and beating up one of the uh, rovers from the 90s. Oh, yeah? <laughs> yeah. It wasn't Megatron because he was in Hoover Dam, frozen. Oh, I know. He was, yeah, he was in Hoover Dam, yeah. Movie. Movie. Oh, that could have been a Mars movie. It could have been. I'm surprised they didn't make it a Mars movie. Well, you kind of showed Mars on there, but I could include that because it was the only good Transformers movie. Yeah, no kidding. Well, it's just travesty what they did to Optimus Prime. Anyway. Don't even get me started on Bumblebee. I loved Bumblebee. Bumblebee was awesome. I loved that they, they had to use the radio in order to make him communicate rather than giving him his own voice. I thought that was a nice touch. I didn't like that the fact they changed the car to suit the commercial. Yeah, that was just uh, a selling that, point. That, to me, I was like, I would have really liked to have seen it as the bug, like yeah. a new bug. Have you ever had a problem with product placement? What are you talking about, James? What's wrong with paid product placements? Yeah, I talk about it, it's like a bad thing. Okay, Curtis is looking around for anything he can grab. I'm, I'm looking like, do I got anything? Here? <laughs> no, not really. Nothing different than yours there. <laughs> Well, it's the first time we've done Coke is usually it's Pepsi and mine and we do that bit. <laughs> we haven't done that like a month or so. And we haven't done that in a long time, but I, I know that my cup's going to disappear. Yeah. Yep. Okay. It's going Assume cosmic on you. Let's right here of the share of. Uh... Nope. We just had those two clips right there of uh, Perseverance to share. The landing and the uh, oh, <laughs> clang clang. Vivian, Vivian says it sounds like my car when I drive. <laughs> <laughs> well, and she said she's in the process of getting the whole front end rebuilt. <laughs> well, that sounds about right then. Well, if you're driving on Mars, you might want to double check, take care of and ever do it. Because I mean, I watched something. Let, let's look up, or if any of the audience can Google for us, what is a human voice supposed to sound like? Is it higher pitched or lower pitched on Mars? I want to say lower. Let's find out what Google says. So let's look it up right quick. While we're doing that, should we go ahead and talk about the other two spacecraft that uh, landed? Actually, no. Uh, it would be higher because if you think about helium, helium is really thin gas. And that causes your voice to go a little higher. Are you and then sure? there's just a little bit less. And then, you, and then you have the uh, evil twin of helium, sulfur hexafluoride. That makes your voice go really, really low. You'll sound like the lowest part of the Gatlin brothers. Yeah, exactly. So, yeah, if you spoke on Mars and same density and all that, you'd sound like a chipmunk. <laughs> wow. Wow. Yeah. We're going to have to try that one, night. We're going to have to do another sciencey episode. Okay. Um, what's amazing is the fact is, you know, that, that as amazing as Perseverance is, there are two other countries that actually launched spacecraft to mars i think it's probably fair to point out that i think the launch window is when mars matches up let me go like this when earth and mars get close it's about every two and a half years right yeah so every two and a half years is when we basically come chasing back around our own orbit and we catch up to it again yeah and then that's the launch window where it only takes about an average six months for our spacecraft to go from earth to mars yeah it's a mars transfer orbit is what they call it it's the it. window of opportunity that, that like you said three different countries usa included took advantage of this time around in order to send something out there yeah and i think there's the only currently before february mm -hmm. the only countries that ever got anything over to mars is the united states ussr and japan yeah uh which is recently changed now so uh at the about the same they all were, were arrived within they all left earth orbit last summer or not left but left earth yeah uh about mid last summer six months later you finally have these spacecraft arriving all within a couple of weeks of each other. And it's a fun little road first, trip. <laughs> yeah, road trip. <laughs> so the first one worth mentioning right here is we're kind of a surprise is the United Arab Emirates wow. launched the uh, Al Amal, which translates to hope. That's actually designed to read, I believe, is that uh, the uh, thin, the thinning atmosphere of, uh, of Mars, if I believe. Mm -hmm. Somebody fact check me on that one if any of our audience wants to. And the second one is pretty dang ambitious, is the Tianwen-1 from China. And this is not only an orbiter, it's got a lander on it, just like we talked about with some of the Viking missions. Um, that it arrived there, and 
uh, you know, they were, the Chinese somehow sometimes know how to put on a show because here is actual video of Tian Wen actually going over and achieving Mars orbit. This is real. So let me get it queued up here. I might have to skip past the. Uh, I'll go ahead and turn off the reporter right here and skip ahead a little bit. Yeah. There we go. So what you're seeing right there is the actual spacecraft and that is Mars in the background that it's achieving. And it went very low to achieve that because it basically comes in and a tight you swing around. See uh, a couple craters there. Yeah, you see the craters moving right there. And while you're seeing the shaking right there, um, can you explain the shaking at all, Curtis? Yeah, that's... Uh... That's from gas thrusters that are actually adjusting its course so that way it can actually enter Mars orbit because the speed that any aircraft heads out there, if they don't have a way of slowing it down once it gets there, it's just going to do like a, a gravity assist maneuver and it's just going to sling right around it and just keep going. Yeah, just like so, we did for like, say, uh, not like whatever, oh, whatever Horizons was that went by. New uh, Horizons that went past horizons, Pluto. Uh, when we had Gemini go out to Saturn and we needed it to stop at Saturn, it had some adjustment thrusters that slowed it down so that way it could sit there in orbit for i think it was 12 years that it sat there and took a whole bunch of good images yeah mm -hmm. so, so it actually had, had, had a question it had a rocket going at the back end it was descending and that's what we're seeing the shaking of is it's getting to mars and achieve that orbit uh, it's not like juno that went around jupiter where it did a polar orbit around jupiter and i think it had its uh its engine going for to slow down to achieve mars uh jupiter uh polar orbit around jupiter was like 11 and a half minutes yeah, about. That's and they had to start real early. <laughs> oh, yeah. And to, to achieve polar orbit around Jupiter, that's up there with the moon landing. Yeah. No, Jupiter's gravity up makes up. it insanely difficult to get something to orbit around there. It's almost next to impossible. Like, for, for the longest time, we thought it was impossible. We didn't think we were going to have anything that was going to orbit around Jupiter proper. Mm -hmm. So uh, Vivian has a question. She said, um, are these countries going to share their findings with each other? I certainly hope so. J I mean, the UAE, just, yes. Tip typically, countries like uh, Japan join with um, the European Space Agency for one of its uh, rovers and spacecraft. Actually, uh, Cassini was a good example mm -hmm. where you have two space agencies working together. You had the European Space Agency with NASA and Cassini, the one around orbit around uh, Saturn that went for like, what, 20 years had the Huygens probe that actually dropped into and parachuted and landed on its moon Triton. Or Titan. Titan, Titan yeah. Titan. And King that's Triton. incredible. Huh? King Triton from the ocean. The, the only, yeah. The only problem is, is that NASA by law is prohibited from working with the Chinese, space, China Space Agency. Theoretically, they would share information, but like I said, there's, they're prohibited by law. I don't know the specific law uh, yeah, to work either. with the uh, Chinese Space Agency. They'd like to share information. Typically, countries do on that scientific endeavor because it's considered uh, in the spirit and advancement of human uh, humanity's knowledge. Mm -hmm. It is a noble cause and a noble, it, it, it's a noble pursuit. Yeah, in that conversation, borders drop. They don't mean squat. We all talk to each other on an equal level basis. It's, we, we, we got to spread that concept in so many other ways. Yeah, and it, it, it is so civilized in the concept of uh, sharing the science on it for space exploration. It is very positive. I mean, what's what's another word here? What's the word I'm looking for here? Inclusive. Inclusive uh, yeah. and very, refreshing. And very refreshing, yeah. And minty flavor. Clovers, okay. Still, um, on, uh, still on St. Patty's from last week, are you, James? <laughs> yes, yes, I am. You watched that episode, you were commenting. Yeah, I was there. <laughs> All right. Um, what else do we? It was going to be one of those uh, later episodes again. I know we're already at eleven oh eight. We're we're, <laughs> no. we're getting through oh, it though. We're doing doing a little better than we did last week. Uh, yeah. Well, this will we folks. We had to cut stuff out of the show, and we knew we we're still running long. <laughs> yeah. On this one, so we've covered. Uh, We've covered ingenuity. We've covered perseverance on there. We've covered the other two spacecraft that came. I do want to say one last Cody. thing about. I do want to yes. say one last thing about perseverance before we get off of it. And this is the important part. Perseverance is the first of two missions. What it's yes. 
the main the main difference between perseverance and curiosity is perseverance has a coring drill on a robotic arm that sticks out the front end of it. The idea is it's going to take coring samples out of the surface of the planet. They're going to be sized about the, about the same size as your typical stick of chalk from elementary school, and it's going to hermetically seal it into little capsules. And this is NASA's terminology, by the way. They this is what they say it. It's literally going to poop them out the back end, leaving them on the surface. So that way, the second mission, the second part of it, there is going to be the first mission to actually return from Mars to Earth. They're going to have a small rover that's going to go around, collect these samples, get it back to a Mars escape vehicle, which is what they're currently calling it. And that's going to bring those samples back to Earth so that we, we can study them. So that's the main thing that Perseverance is doing. That's the whole goal is it's there to, to get these samples, seal them up, prepare them so that way we can later return them to Earth. So I think it's going to be supposed to be the, the words are later this decade for that for Mars return mission with those samples, right? Yeah, Persever that's what they're shooting for is later this decade in the 2027, 2028, somewhere there. Perseverance poops. Perseverance poops. <laughs> you, know, you, you want to be the scientist. You wonder what the scientist that goes, what's the term I can use for this? Let's just go poop. And did he did he go? <laughs> 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 something like that yeah probably <laughs> i said poop on a scientific paper yeah right. or a space term nice nice so what is did we fit, talk about everything with perseverance yeah that was that was that was it for me let's not forget it has a laser really cool information it's got a laser it's got a laser <laughs> Savia, it's got a laser. If you went over there and you walked up to Perseverance going, I'm just going to take this part because it's part of Tex, Tex, uh, Space Texas pick apart. It'll look at you and go, no, no. Nope. <laughs> It'll shoot a laser at you and you'll either go, you'll either disintegrate or you'll go, ow, ow. More like you'll go, ow. Yeah, more like. Yeah. There's actually an audio that they released as well of the first time that they fired that laser to take um, an optical sample of like, what the surface would do from from the laser fire gives it a better spectrum as to what it's made out of i can kind of imitate it, it basically it's yeah that's just it. a little click that's it and you mean when you listen laser. to it you're like that you're, you're going to sit back and go to the recording like i'm going to listen to a space laser you hear click 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 you're like <laughs> it's a space laser <laughs> okay that's it. no pew pew no pew pew Oh my gosh. Okay, so <laughs> Vivian said, will that create Mars COVID 2020 when those samples return to Earth? <laughs> oh my gosh. Actually, there's a really interesting history on quarantine. Yeah, actually. Uh, quarantining um, stuff, foreign extrasolar when, bodies, I guess. When they were making Perseverance, uh, it's actually another thing to note is the equipment on Perseverance is the most sterile equipment in the solar system currently. They made it as clean as they possibly could. So that way they can eliminate all possible contamination of the samples that they collect. So that's literally the cleanest equipment that we've ever made, as well as the most complex that we've ever launched. We don't want to take a chance on if there's already any sort of microbial native life to Mars, mm -hmm. we do not want to pollute it with Earth life. Exactly. Yeah. I mean, we already, humanity's already kind of learned about that over the last few hundred years. Yeah, and we'll, kind of screw other other populations. What's the little critter that can survive in the vacuum of space? There's Tart now tardigrade. millions of them. Yeah, tardigrades. There's now millions of them out on the moon just from the Apollo missions because they weren't able to like completely clean them off correctly. Yeah, wow. they're not exactly reproducing, but those things can survive they, in space for a while. They live a long time. They live a long time, but you know they're basically they go dormant. Mm -hmm. uh, like I said, they're not actively. There's not like a castle anthrax of tardigrades going. You know, play, playing uh, poor music or anything like that, having a house. Um, but well, that's, that's like still so crazy, analogy, though, but funny. Yeah. Huh? It's still crazy about like the contamination issue of yeah. you know things yeah. that are going on here. Because remember, Perseverance left during COVID too. It actually left beforehand. It it launched. I want to say um, late 2019. Was it? Oh. Um, it's six month mission, dude. Oh yeah. Six month trip. It launched last summer. No, yeah, it launched summer of twenty. So yeah, it did um, launch in the middle that, of the COVID stuff. Uh, with the scientists and whatnot. I mean, it launched about the same time as like say uh, some of that crew that went that, that did a basically a sample mission, riding specs, uh, SpaceX's Dragon capsule up to ISS, and they're all up there for like three weeks. Yeah, uh, guaranteed. 
there with COVID going on, it's not going to be a problem. COVID hit, you know, be the, those, those uh, astronauts being exposed to COVID because they don't want to have that go up to ISS. No, they quarantined those astronauts for, I think it was three and a half weeks to make sure that they were completely free of the virus if, the, if it wasn't their system at all to begin with. And granted, and yeah, they and were, as, as much as the, the, the clean rooms kept uh, curiosity, perseverance, clean, you need a problem with COVID. COVID is not like on every surface where it's like all over this Coke or something like that. Yeah. Um, there's actually an office. I, 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 tell, please remind, no, let, remind me of the name. There's actually an office that deals with uh, if there's any possible life on a on a on a uh, extrasolar bo uh, body, another planet, moon, whatever. That there is actually that this office, as little known as it is, actually has veto power over a mission if it could possibly endanger or pollute any life or potential life a planet or moon could have. Am I correct? I've heard of it, yeah, but I don't know the name of the office either. Um, it's a little known, but it actually, based on the ethics of oh, that, yeah. has veto power over a mission. Yeah, they can actually say, nope, it's not going. You're not prepared prepared well enough yet. Ba based on not wanting to contaminate another body that might possibly have life. Because, I mean, I don't want to I don't want to go like, you know, say you find you think you find life on one of the moons of, say, uh, Neptune. Got to be or cold. Say, or, or say we go to, realistically, this is a mission that they are looking for looking to do eventually say they go to titan on saturn it's one of the most uh probable places that we could find outside of the asteroid belt that life could exist because with, me with methane lakes with methane lakes with frozen lakes underneath the ice they could yep. they could potentially find forms of life down there and when we do send anything up there they are going to be very 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 stringent about how clean they make that spacecraft in order to get it up there because it's the biggest potential to find life. And if we actually find it, if there's any find out there. Best chance is that spot right there. Oh, that'll be so often we find multicellular or even, you know, primitive fish underneath the ice in the methane lakes. That would be cool. Oh boy. Yeah. Oh man. But then I'm like, is there, are there, um, how are they um, bringing stuff back? Cause like, think about like the obvious opposite contamination. Well, that's, that's, you're, you're not wrong there, but, um, Mainly yeah, with, more experience uh, with that than you think. Yeah. Mainly with places out that far like Titan and Saturn and Saturn and Jupiter's moons and everything, get coming back is way harder than it'll be getting out there. Oh, but I'm so, talking about the Mars I'm talking about the Mars samples that they're gonna oh. up. Yeah, well remember the samples that they're that they have them in there are hermetically sealed. They're perfectly there no microbes will be able to get out, no microbes will be able to get in. So once they get it into a lab, they'll have it in a completely clean room environment. So that way, once they do open it up and they start uh, investigating, they start uh, researching into it, anything that they find will truly only be Mars material. So they've, they've already got some uh, labs that are getting set up for when that happens. Oh, but I'm saying like, how do they contain the items in the clean rooms? Do you know what I'm saying? Like you hear, you know, all these sci-fi movies of you see that things okay. are brought back. It's a movie. <laughs> yeah, keyword there is movie. I know, but there isn't necessarily any any like. It doesn't mean that just because you hear about these like uh, extraterrestrial wars with people and this and that going on right now. Mm. <laughs> that you know, I don't know. It's like maybe it's a little it's a little movie-ish, but at the same time, maybe it's true. There's some crazy things that have happened. There are some crazier things that happened, yeah. We, we we've are, we we've been uh, quarantining and isolating and keeping uh, pure. Uh, Vivian, uh, because accidents happen. Huh? Accidents happen. That's what she's saying. Like, in the, yeah, it's like, you know, they bring back the samples from Mars and they accidentally drop like two microbes on their jacket sleeve. And then it goes out into the world here. The clean rooms, they have a, um, they have a spray down kind of smaller room at the entrance that's, that basically completely wipes them clean of anything that could come in or could come out. So that, that's we've actually been dealing with, uh, with, uh, samples from uh, a planetary body for several years. It's called the moon rocks. 
And when the moon rocks, I think they were they were quarantined for like six months before that uh, scientists were able to actually start sampling it yep. make, to, to study, make sure there's nothing that came. And even the astronauts that came back for the moon were quarantined for 14 days. No, three weeks, three weeks, excuse me. Yeah, I was about to say, I thought it was a little longer than that. Yeah, it, they quarantined for three weeks in case they brought anything back. And these guys were probed and checked and checked and checked and checked until, you know, they're going nuts. They were very meticulous about it, yeah. You're very meticulous. So even in the 60, the Moon missions in the late 60s, early 70s, that was still thought of and the process have only gotten better. Um, the other part to remember is that when you talk about uh, something coming from another planet or even an asteroid and having possibly dormant microbial, microbial life that could create the next, uh, you know, space Ebola or whatever. Yeah. You got to remember, there are tons and tons of material in dust in space that are floating out from parts of Mars because it could be an impact that knocks off parts of Mars and dust that we're floating through that is floating into Earth's atmosphere every day. Um, space ain't so empty as one might think. It's still space, you know. Yeah. But like I said, there there are there is dust, interstellar, interplanetary, whatever the Earth is going through because we're basically floating through a big dust cloud, the interstellar system. Yep. And it's descending on Earth every day. And um, had not been a problem yet. No. Yeah, there's aware of. literally like just walking outside. It could be during um, best, best time for it, I want to say, is right at sunup is the most concentrated because that's when you're facing forward in Earth's orbit. That's the, t the direction that we're traveling. Yeah. So early morning, if you go outside and take a nice run, you're getting a nice shower of space dust right then. Ah. So Savea, wear a hat. <laughs> wear okay. a poncho. I'll wear, I'll wear a, a gas mask while I go running. There you go. I'm protecting myself from space dust. <laughs> <laughs> Let's see if we have any other questions. Vivian says, excellent. It's happening. You know, Vivian, we're having fun with it, but those are fantastic questions and fantastic, legitimate concerns. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So, hey, James, do we have enough time to do our a little bit of our fun stuff that we prepared? I think we do. We have to do it. We ready? <laughs> Go for it. We uh, not only do we talk about space and, you know, uh, let me get it queued up. OK, we talk about space and science stuff. We want to look at practical applications that our audience can relate to with their daily work, uh, their daily routines that we want to compare the science of what we're talking about, uh, be it on Mars or in orbit. Or space and travel. To what things that they can relate to in their daily lives. So we present to you beating native beadwork in microgravity. Yes, I thought this was a very, very important segment that we needed to do. And I think that the thing is, is that 100%, I think I could probably give the best advice on how to bead with microgravity. Gotcha. Okay, shall we go to slide one? Sure, yeah. You're bit. All right, okay. get it up. All right, so um, I don't know if you guys know, but think about it, no gravity. So there's a couple things you have to worry about. Okay, if you're beading and there's no gravity, you're gonna have beads all over the air. So that's kind of scary, right? <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> We have these really cool mats that actually stick there. You can stick it to any service and you can empty out the beads and stick them to the mat. So then you could lay out your beads with no gravity. How great is that? That would be a big help. Right? Because I'm thinking, you know, that could be, you know, people always worried about dropping their beads on the ground or spilling their beads everywhere. Can you imagine if they're floating everywhere in the air? Wow. So that would cause a NASA engineer in the shuttle to freak the heck out. <laughs> You're like, oh my God, what is this? Plus imagine and, imagine breathing inside your, your spacecraft with all those beads floating around. You're just like <laughs> <laughs> the whole time. Oh my God. I didn't even think about that. Yeah. The other thing is, so that's if you if you're beading with loose beads. If you have Hanks and you keep your beads on the string. You can use a little clip and you can clip the ends of the strings and so they'll be like all like this you know all the bead strings will be like this and you can take specific ones and just put your needle right in 
and pick the beads you want and you're going to have these beads all flying all over but they're on strings so that was the other thing so you have loose and if it's on a string okay james next slide okay so this is a new product that we just got it's actually a heart that has it's a plastic heart and it has a really strong magnet underneath and there's another magnet so it basically is a super duper strong magnet so you can use this where you can you can either use it to hold your project together like front and back like if you have like a bead foundation and a backing but you also could use it like to put it on your shirt and you can put your needle on it oh so there you go it won't fly away <coughs> i'm sorry i got a little bit in my throat come here there you go I gave my dog a piece of apple. <laughs> okay, now this one is really cool. So this is a thread cutter pendant. So you can actually make a necklace and instead of having to have scissors hanging around everywhere, like, you know, but you can get stabbed in the eye and stuff. Yeah, that's a problem. This, you can wear it around your wrist, probably around your wrist versus like as a necklace. I would wear it as like as a bracelet charm. And then what you could do is you could use it to cut the thread. So you don't have thread going all, you, you, you don't have to have scissors and you can just cut it real easily. So that's kind of a cool way to, you know, think about not having, not, it's like not running with scissors, you know? And then plus it's like kind of jewelry, right? <laughs> yeah, it's aesthetically pleasing. I kind of like it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it kind of looks like vintage and stuff. Like 1970s, yeah? A little bit. Yeah, baby. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. James, next slide. See, this is what it looks like up close because it's in the package. Okay, I think we have one more slide, don't we? Yes, there's still one more slide. There's some more slides. I don't remember. Okay, so this is another one. So this needle, it has a little hook on the end. So you can actually pick up the needle and you don't have to worry about it coming. Like it actually has a little hook so it stays on the bead versus stabbing a bead and it pops up you can actually stab it and it will actually go up and stay on past that hook piece how do you get it back off again uh well it's it's, it's like a it's like a spring loaded uh it's kind of like a like a a pointy j like oh, you okay, yeah, I see. J and it's pointy it's actually in the circle here so it actually if you do need to take the beads off you could take it off and put it right on your sticky mat but at least with this, like, it kind of will stay on versus, like, say you have a regular needle and your th needle, you're threading it with beads, you're putting beads on it, and beads start to fall off because you moved your arm or something. Yeah, that would also make uh, setting up each row of, a like, a loom work job much, much easier because you can set oh, up yeah. each row totally. perfectly. Totally. Okay, do we have another one? Uh, that is about the last one on that slide. Okay, all right. So there you go, guys. There are ways to bead in space and it won't be too crazy. You just have to go prepared <laughs> and think outside the box. Think spacey. And I thought underwater <clears throat> basket weaving was the most bizarre thing I was going to hear about. Beading in space, that takes the cake. Yeah, right? Like I was thinking about like, no one's ever talked about trying to bead in space. So I think we're probably the first people ever to talk about beading in space like how would you bead in we space? we are pioneers yep we got to give the yeah. astronauts up on the iss something else to do even though their time's taken up freaking 100 percent. exactly <laughs> oh man yeah, yeah they're, they're they're they are so structured on everything they do from hour to hour minute to minute yeah can you imagine they probably need a little bit of r and r they can make some bracelets or something up there mm -hmm. <laughs> not much because they got to keep them busy with routines otherwise you're stuck in a big box of 250 miles above the earth. Yeah. Orbiting once every hour and a half. There is no going outside for a stroll. Yeah. Although I would still have a chance to, I would still have a chance of getting some photos out of their couple of their, their big, basically window dome. That's always facing oh, yeah. the earth and you can see all the beautiful images. Oh yeah. But you know, after, you know, what was it? Six or eight months is the average uh, time for each About. person to serve on the ISS. I imagine you'd be like, you know, you've got that, I'm here, you're looking at like, there's the earth. And after like month, four and a half, or, you know, in five months in, you're going, is this thing open? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's true. But you know, you gotta keep, they got to keep you busy for your, 
your own mental state. You know, well, but they got to keep really... you busy as well physically because being in a zero G uh, environment like that, oh, yeah. microgravity environment, you actually get dystrophy pretty quickly in your muscles. That's why, like, whenever you see an astronaut come back from the ISS once they land out in like Kazakhstan or something, where, wherever they typically touch down, uh, they're uh, literally lifted up out of the capsule and they're like they don't they can't walk they they don't they don't have the ability to walk back on one g of earth wow right. i think you know things like osteoporosis they're a lot more prone to osteoporosis coming back develop mm -hmm. well prone to that uh body that lengths well. the feet aren't used and so they basically resemble babies a newborn baby's feet as far as soft the skin is and whatnot yep uh there's all kinds of things there's cataracts that develop I mean, they have ways on board. They have exercise equipment on board to give you some like resistance movement as well as like a yeah. treadmill type type workout to try and like negate that a little bit. But it's still it's not perfect. It, wow. It's a good mitigation from the deterioration yeah. of the body in those respects, but it ain't stopping it. It slows it down, but it doesn't stop it. Yeah, that's the main that's the main thing with uh, the six month voyage to Mars is sending uh, humans there, which is considering the mass that's got to take them. We're probably looking like seven to eight months to Mars. Yeah. And that's where the big concern is the deterioration of the body over that length of time and yeah. the mental strain because mm -hmm. yeah. uh, the, the, you, you don't even have a plan. You don't have live out. conversations anymore. <laughs> yeah. Like, like the, the, the five or five months or so in the middle of that trend, the, the transition you were talking about, like the eight months of transit time, like the five or six months in the middle, you're so far away from earth and so far away from Mars. You really don't have anything cool to look at. Everything is just a dot really far away. It's like, yeah. yeah bring a couple anyway. movies <laughs> and the thing is i think with movies like people have a, a very different view of what it's like because they think about star trek and star wars and they see people walking on platforms and they're in the gravity they have gravity on the ship and artificial gravity yeah and i mean is that even really possible i mean like is that even really a possibility of having gravity? The only way to that? achieve artificial gravity Suspend? is through uh, centrifugal motion. Yeah. That's what I thought. And that and might be very through. difficult. Oh, sorry. Very difficult to have centrifugal motion in space when you're trying to go straight. Yeah, well, yeah, well you can thing. have it. You've got these rotating body, but you've got a center mass. But with those rotating, what's that do to the thing? Well, it, it gives you a gyroscopic effect that stabilizes you looking forward. Just the same as you got that little gyro that you can sit on the table that, that holds True. itself vertical. So you have that working for you. Uh, the problem, though, is that still takes energy to start the movement, to start the spin, and then it takes energy to stop it once you get to Mars. So that's all more things, added things that you have to take into account when you're doing that. Yeah. The other part is like the personality types. It's not talked about that much is that... Mm -hmm. um, if you talk about some of the people like, uh, you know, go to International Space Station, they're not the most thrilling people to talk to. They're not, some are, some do a good interview, but most are not particularly dynamic. These are people that are ultra chill. Ultra chill, really focused on their uh, specialty. So, yeah, casual conversation sometimes is hard to find. There's a bit of introvert there. Mm -hmm. But, you know, they're, they're super stable is the term that the scientists want using what you want. You don't want Michael Bay, the star of a Michael oh, Bay film in, on a space. You don't want, you don't oh. want, uh, what's that show? Da, da, Jerry, Jerry. Oh, God. <laughs> <laughs> Which movie is that? Jerry Springer show. <laughs> yeah, you don't want people of that caliber. You don't want anybody that would be in that audience, especially with fold-up chairs on yes, the way to please, Mars. No. <laughs> that would be crazy. That would be crazy. But, you know, I think that um, we would really love to talk more, but, I mean, we're already, like, an extra half an hour past. we got to kill We, even, we yeah. didn't even do our Q&A. We can do a lightning round if you want. Yeah, we have we have a few awesome questions we wanted right, to we we come in. Okay, okay. So let me give you guys the question. Uh, Curtis probably is the best person to answer some of these. Absolutely. Okay. Let's see. Okay. I have these questions here. Okay. So, Curtis, first question that I needed to ask you. Let's see. Do -do. Uh, maybe it's better to look on my phone. 
Where is it? My phone's gone. I'm trying to look at here. Okay. All right. Once your computer got started working, the phone went bye-bye. <laughs> yeah, I don't know where the phone went. Okay, let's see here. Uh, batteries. Okay, is the moon a planet? No. Next is question. Demos and Phobos planets? Say again? Are Deimos and Phobos planets? No. Next question. Are, are they asteroids? Used to be. Now they're moons, right? Now they're moons. They're satellites. 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 Natural satellites. We only call our moon the moon, but anything that orbits other planets, they're typically called satellites or moon for short. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Never mind. Well, it's just like it, it's the equivalent of calling the sun a star. We name yeah. it the star, and we call other stars their names for the stars. Mm -hmm. But it's like calling our sun star. You know, it's like you know the star. It's a star. Yeah. Exactly. It's you know, that's the same as our moon calling our moon a moon. Yeah, more or less. Okay, okay. So I have right. the, found the questions. All right. Okay. So, what are the top tips? Do you have what? What top tips do you have for someone new wanting to take photos of the solar system in the night sky or wonders in the night sky? Practice, practice, practice. Um, oh, yeah. First, learn your scope. Learn how to use your scope. Learn how to set it up. Learn all the intricacies you can about it. Because if you don't know how to use that scope, your camera is useless anyway. So you got to learn the scope. You got to learn how to use it. Uh, then second, figure out how to pair your camera to the scope. If it's going to be your cell phone, or if it's going to be a camera proper, like what I'm saving up to get. You got to learn how to use them both independently. And then you learn with practice how to use them together. So it just, it takes time. It's not something you can learn overnight. It, Okay, so is that the best advice? Yeah, Plus just there, practice, 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 and just is have fun. There, is there anyone on YouTube or anything you know of that does this kind of thing that you could like say, hey, check out those people, or I found this information interesting? There's well, yeah, there's, or... there's a group on Facebook that I'm a member of. Uh, it's called Backyard Astronomy, mm -hmm. and it's about 25,000 members strong, and it is a massively useful pool of information to go off of if you cool. go in there and you want to start learning and you have questions post it to that group and you will have a huge pool of information a lot of experience to go go off of and you'll cool. learn something backyard astronomy facebook group yep okay uh what is your favorite planet or star well we touched on the subject my favorite star is actually our own the sun because any other star that you look at even through a telescope it looks the same through the scope as it does if you're just looking at it. It's just a very fine little point of light because they're so far away, you don't really see anything. So the best star that I enjoy looking at is the one that gives us the daytime. Because you can see more detail out of that thing. Planet-wise, got to be Saturn because anytime I so show somebody Saturn and they see those rings for the first time, the, the first impression is always amazing to watch. Like their reaction, the way that they see it, they're just, that's, part of what keeps me into astronomy is seeing somebody experience that for the first time cool okay let's see i think i have one more question and i lost it while i was working <laughs> of course i lost it right because i was trying to click around and i just double clicked what is your favorite planet within our solar system okay uh okay so now this is a question i think all of us can do Okay, let's have uh, Curtis answer first. Okay. If there were a chance to visit Mars for you, would you, if you did go, what would be one thing you would leave for another life to find? Like a life being defined. First off, without skipping a beat, absolutely, yes, I would go. Get me to Mars. I want to go there right now. Get me off this rock. <laughs> anyway. Uh, if I had to go there, what I would leave there probably be a plushie of Marvin the Martian. <laughs> oh. just, just something wacky for someone to find, be, be cruising along on their little rover and just be like, what the heck is he doing here? <laughs> I think that'd be pretty funny. It's awesome. I love it. Okay. James, what about James, you? What about you? I'm going to surprise you with a fairly noble answer. Uh oh. A reproduction of the gold record that's on Voyager 2 yes that contains and the, and the plaque that mm -hmm. contains a sample of the human dna strand um a 
a, 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 a star system, a star map triangulated with our, star, our sun at the middle to know our location, our, our sun, the location of our planet in the solar system, third rock, third rock from the sun, and a gold record that contains uh, some of the best music samples of, uh, of, the, of the human history, as well as greetings in 50 different languages. That would, that would be a good thing to leave behind. There's some things to left behind, but I think that is absolutely the most noble and uh, because space, space exploration is a noble, is a noble endeavor as it is. And that's what I think would, that's what I would leave. Man, then the question comes to me. Oh my. I just shocked the, the hell out of Savannah. To... <laughs> yeah, how do you follow that? I know, right? So, well, so would you go to Mars? And if you did, what would you leave there? I don't know if I would want to go to Mars because it's so like what we were talking about, like it's so hard to go there physically. I think that would be very difficult. I mean, it would be amazing to go, but I mean, honestly, I really love being here. <laughs> oh, there's Oculus. But if I, yeah, if I was going, you know, I, it's like knowing like about thinking about, you know, being safe like if if i didn't have to worry about any kind of things getting you know cross contamination and all that like i'm not worried about that okay i'm not going to worry about that look at vivian um, look huh at vivian. look at vivian's post what did vivian do? <laughs> vivian's <A> starbucks <laughs> cup, <laughs> <Vivian's> <laughs> starbucks cup. Yep. well um i think it might be kind of cool to to leave some kind of like what James is saying, he's saying like, you know, all this different stuff with like, you know, science and all that kind of stuff. But what if we left like some music and some art that kind of, you know, some music, like some music and art or, and even maybe some like movies, like historical documents, like in, uh, Zombies, of <laughs> like the in Galaxy <laughs> Quest. So we would leave like a whole, like the whole series of all the Star Wars movies up on Mars for people to watch. It <laughs> would be kind of cool. That would be it. I don't know if they have the right format to watch it, but <laughs> that'd be kind of a cool. I'm pretty, thing. I'm pretty sure at that point they would have something that could make it work. Yeah. This is gonna be this is gonna be kind of weird, but honestly, if you're gonna pick a body, I would actually I would find Venus more scientifically interesting. Really. Why would you say that? Uh, it's atmosphere dynamics. I'll take the atmosphere. Why does it have no moon? Well, there's reasons for that, but it's orbit. Uh, it's it's surface and it, geology. Is, and isn't Venus the one that actually spins the opposite direction of all the rest of the planets? That's actually Uranus. No, Uranus is the one that spins on its side. It doesn't. I, I don't. Does Venus? Venus? Venus rotates in the opposite direction. It, it, it's in a retrograde. Place. Yeah, it's incredibly slow. One Venusian day is close to a full Venusian year. I think you're right about that. But well, yeah, I said it, it was more scientifically interesting than yeah. Mars. Mars is just a great time capsule. Venus is still so active. Now, James, you mentioned something about when talking about Svea going to Mars that we do have the Oculus. The you're talking about the virtual reality headset, yes. right? We could do something with perseverance with all the cameras that are on board that thing. If the main camera mast, yeah, that thing, the main camera mast on perseverance has two cameras that are like six or seven inches apart. Imagine if they took video from those cameras and we could use it in that Oculus and you could get a 3D look of what it would be like if you're out on Mars. So cool. There's been rough, uh, rough, granted, it's stacked and it's definitely enhanced. Yeah. It's been done with pictures from Curiosity. Uh, this would be a lot more legit because we're getting a heck of a lot more sharper pictures off. Uh, a lot more sharper pictures and the ability of having video. Huh? <laughs> a lot sharper pictures, like you said, and the ability of having video. So you can actually have like a video experience rather than just looking at stills after still, after still, after yeah. still. Oh, yeah. So that would be really cool. Sorry. Sometimes there's a little bit of drag and a little bit of time delay. So I may be talking. I, all of a sudden it jumps. I see you talking. It's like, okay. Yeah. Sorry about that. <laughs> yeah. All right. Well, like when I when I click a video, when I click a, advance a slide, it takes a second and a half to appear on Zoom. Oh yeah. wow! Really? Like, like light going from the moon to the Earth, a two second delay. <laughs> wow! Yeah. Second and a half, because yeah. for I am 
on Mars. You are. It does take a little bit of time. Anyway. <laughs> so I think that did we talk about all the stuff that we have, James? Because yeah, we just got to introduce next week's show. Gone over today. Oh uh, yeah, think <laughs> just a little. Yeah, just a little. It was a right, lot me... of fun going out over. It was a really oh, yeah. interesting, um, a very interesting show. I think for everyone. Gotcha. So let me introduce next week's the theme of next week's show. We're going to go from the stars to domestic. Mm-hmm. It's spring. It's springtime. And we want to talk about spring cleaning and new beginnings. Yes, we do. Because we just thought, you know what? It's the spring. Let's, you know, like out with the old, in with the new. Let's like clean out our dusty, dusty, you know, sweep out all the dust. Especially out of the clean room where satellites and spacecraft are made. Anyway, especially there. Yeah, so that's what we're cleaner, looking yeah. at for next week. Yes. That's our next show. Yes. Lord knows that it, it, this will give me inspiration to do some spring cleaning in the in 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 the studio. Yeah, and to this week we're not going to do a river dance out the show. No, we're going back. <laughs> we're, we're not going to river dance. Yeah. So. so. <sighs> okay, so I'm getting ready. All right. Uh, final words, anybody? It was a pleasure, guys. This was a lot of fun. Thank you for having me. Thank, Thank you, you so Curtis, for coming back. We may ask you to come back another time. We talk about another planetary body. You know what we yeah. could talk about, which would be really interesting. Maybe we could talk about science versus fiction. Because, like, uh, I attended a panel um, at Comic Con, and they were talking about how the different movies and TV shows inspired technology that's happening, and we're trying to make it happen. So it might be kind of cool to talk about that and and think about all the interesting things that we've seen on the movies and TV that came from and now exists. Like, you know, everyone doesn't think about it, but you know the grocery stores, how the doors go. Yeah, that that was inspired by Star Trek. Right? Yeah, before then it was rotary doors where that would spin like this. Yeah, there were rotary doors or there was doors that would automatically swing open, you know? You remember that? Mm-hmm. It had the, the the pad you would step on and it would open. Yeah, with little dotted lines on the ground for you to steer yeah. clear of so that way you don't get hit by the door. Yeah, I remember that. Yeah. And the thing is, like, I don't, I bet you, like, if you think, if you ask people and say, hey, how do you think that these, these sliding doors came from and see if anyone thinks about it, like, you know, that it was connected to Star Trek. And this this could also be a very dangerous topic, and by that I mean dangerous as in putting us well past the hour like we did tonight and last last time. Is uh, yeah, but it's picking, so damn fun. I know, right? So but interesting. Picking apart the fallacies of science in some of these movies, like trying to pick up pick out what a movie got wrong scientifically or what it got really right. Like I'll I'll start. We'll talk about the Martian. Like we were talking about the atmosphere and how thin it is. The start of the movie when the rocket supposedly is about to get blown over and they boogie out, that would never happen. Um, that was the one part of the movie that just, they got completely wrong, but they had to do it because it was a plot point. Let me, let me, I'm going to give you a face palm when I say this. Armageddon. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. We can have, a, we can have a full like 30, 40 minute conversation just on everything that that got wrong. <laughs> and that's just touching on it, not explaining why yeah then that's any type of detail and we'll have to pick and choose what part of that movie we leave out <laughs> yeah if you, but if anyway, you take I mean, all the scientific inaccuracies you basically have an opening credit and a closing credit yeah, yeah. pretty much <laughs> so i just thought it would be fun maybe that would be a fun episode to do a revisit with science and um space absolutely definitely yeah. something to consider yeah i think that they had people on the sides of the doors, pushing and pulling them together. Actually, I think when people would walk through the doors, they'd have someone pull it open. Yeah, just on cue, just. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh-huh. yeah. You at the supermarkets today. I know, right? They're the, going, going. They're the door gnomes. Yep. The door gnomes. The door gnome. Okay. <laughs> All right, guys. All right. Well, All right, right everybody. Been great. Uh, thank you all for watching again. This has been. Another episode of Late Night Craft Talk. We'll see you all next week. Now we must dance to the closing credits. Dance.